Hi and welcome to my little home shop. Today's video is all about electrical discharge machining or if you prefer EDM. Now electrical discharge machining isn't something that you would use in your home shop but since we're here to learn it's nice to know that these processes exist. So what is EDM? Well EDM is a way to cut material using electrical shocks now, or electrical arcs I should say. So we're going to have an electrode, a work part, and the electrode never actually contacts the work part. But there is an electrical discharge between the two that will come and take away a very small particle of material and in that way erode the part that you're machining. So why would you want to use electrical discharge machining? Two main reasons. First, while it isn't a rotary tool, it's a linear motion tool and that means that you can produce irregularly shaped holes or pockets or cavities easily. So that is one great advantage. If you want to produce a hole that has the shape of a gear, well you can produce an electrode in the shape of that gear and then burn or erode the hole to have that shape. That's a real advantage. The second reason that mostly justifies using EDM is that the hardness of the metal that you're cutting has about no impact on its machinability. In other words, you can EDM a mild steel part just as easily as you can EDM a hardened tool steel. And if you've ever done punch and die work, producing die sets and punch and dies, or if you're working in mold making, well there's a real advantage to be able to heat treat and grind your die, let's say, to start and then perform or produce the irregularly shaped hole. It makes life so simple because there's no deformation caused by the heat treatment the heat treatment has already been performed. Uh, now the other part of that advantage is that the electrical discharge machining has very little impact on the parts hardness. It, we can say that electrical discharge machining does not alter uh, the heat treatment that a part has received. Now another thing to consider is well these machines are quite expensive. But if you do have one kicking around in your shop, well they are great for removing broken taps or any hardened steel stuck in a work part. There is a certain similarity between arc welding and electrical discharge machining. You know when we're arc welding we have a power supply, we have an electrode and we have a grounded part and we create a circuit. As we approach the electrode to the part and spark it off, well it'll start arcing and metal from the electrode will come and deposit itself at the surface of the part which is a molten puddle at that point. Electrical discharge machining is like that but backwards. We're going to be attracting metal from the part towards the electrode and that is where the similarity ends. Now for arc welding we needed a power supply, an electrode and a grounded part. Three things. For electrical discharge machining we need five things. We need the power supply, okay, we know about that. We need a servo mechanism and that's something we haven't been acquainted with. We need the electrode, clear enough. We need the grounded part. And between the electrode and the grounded part, we need a dielectric fluid. So let's take a minute and take a look at the two of those that we're not well acquainted with, the servo mechanism and the dielectric fluid. The servo mechanism is used to maintain an accurate distance between the part and the electrode. Now, if the electrode came down to the part and touched the surface, 
Well, we'd have a closed circuit and there would be no arcing there and no machining going on and we'd probably burn the power supply. We have to maintain a certain distance there, very small but important and accurate. The uh, servo mechanism measures as the tool electrode approaches the workpiece, the tension, and as soon as the spark starts to form, well, it will stop and maintain that distance to the part, cycling up and down very rapidly by a very small amount so that the sparking will continue. Now, we're talking about a cycle up and down of half a thousandth of an inch to a thousandth of an inch, not very much. And we're talking of a cycle of about 20,000 sparks per second or more. I mean, you can use 40, 60, 80,000 per second. That is an awful lot of very small sparks. Each one of those tiny sparks going to pick up a very small amount of material on the part and attract it towards the electrode. Now, there is a great problem there because if that material reaches the electrode, well, it will weld itself to the electrode and the shape of the pocket hole or what we're producing is going to be quite different uh, to that of the electrode. Why don't the globules or the small portions of material come and weld themselves to the electrode? Well, that is because of the dielectric fluid. The dielectric fluid plays two major roles. The first role is guiding. It guides the spark to the proper place on the part. Where is the proper place? Well, the shortest distance at that moment in time between the electrode and the part. And how does it guide it and control the spark? Well, by ionization. The dielectric fluid, by definition, is an insulator. It does not uh, conduct electricity. And that's kind of counterproductive. But as we know, if we can make it pass to the ionized gas state, well, it will conduct electricity. And that's what happens. When the electrode gets close to the part, the energy ionizes a small tube, I guess would be the best way to explain it and describe it really, a small tube of ionized gas. It forms almost instantaneously as the spark travels towards the part. As soon as the spark is cyclical, on, off, on, off, on, off, well, it travels toward this part, and as it hits the part, it melts a small globule. But before it can attract it back to the electrode, the second property of the dielectric fluid comes into play. And that is a cooling and flushing property. The dielectric fluid is in movement. So the piece or part of molten metal is cooled rapidly and flushed away, never coming back towards the electrode. So dielectric fluid here is crucial. And by the way, don't use any hydrocarbon as dielectric fluid. It's usually a light lubricating oil and don't use gasoline or the like because obviously your shop is going to explode. But for now that's enough talking about the subject. I think it's time we go take a look at the subject and we're going to start by looking at the electrodes. Now if you're going to cut anything by electrical discharge machining you're going to have to start by producing some electrodes. I say electrodes and not electrode because we're going to be doing two separate examples. And to produce our electrodes, we're going to be using this material here, which is poco graphite. Probably the best material as far as wear resistance goes when cutting by EDM. Well, if we needed an electrode, we're also going to need something to cut. And we're going to be cutting this high-speed steel tool blank very, very hard. We're going to be doing that to prove a point. We want to demonstrate that electrical discharge machining works on any type of steel irregardless of its hardness. 
So we'll see that we'll be able to produce a hole, note that I didn't say drill, produce a hole in this part by electrical discharge machining. So let's get our safety glasses on, turn around because the lathe is right behind me here and start producing those electrodes. There, a nice tight slide fit. And as you can see, machining graphite is a pretty dirty business. There, the electrode is surfaced, and as you can see, it's mounted in the electrode holder. We're now ready to head over to the mill to give it its final shape. And for that, we're going to be holding the electrode in a square block that mimics the head of the electrical discharge machine. And, well, as usual, we want things to be square, so it has to be well aligned. Now that the block is aligned, and well, the vise is aligned, we can pull the block out and turn it around to look at the business end of it. And we notice that there are four very accurate pins here. Those pins are used to ensure proper alignment of the electrode. Because when the electrode holder is abutted to the pin, everything will be aligned. This milling block, as is the case for the head of the EDM, holds the electrode by hydraulic pressure applied on a sleeve. This is a very accurate way of holding tooling. Now we can set the block back into the vise for milling the flat on our cylindrical electrode. In other words, we're going to be giving it a D shape because we want to create a D-shaped hole. Or, if you want, we could say that we're going to give it D-required shape. Now that I've milled the flat on this electrode, well, it's now bidimensional. And that means that when I use it, I'm going to have to orient that flat somehow. And that's why we're using this block and the four pins. Because when I'm in there and lined up here with the pin, well, the bottom and this flat are parallel. And that really isn't important to know unless you know that this is the head that goes on the EDM. And it has the same four pins oriented the same way in relationship to the main reference surface. So when I put my tool in there and 
lean it up on the pin and lock it in place, my flat will be parallel with the main reference surface and that is very important. The 3R system that I'm using comes with several different machinable electrode holders that can hold a wide range of electrode shapes. The set comes equipped with a machining block, a very accurate machining block that is used to hold the electrodes in position while machining their contours. The machining block permits easy alignment of the electrode because it has the same guide pins as we've seen as the machining head, the magnetic machining head. Now, die sinking EDMs do not have rotary spindles and that is a problem. So this swivel base attachment is really nice because it permits easy edge finding and really is helpful for finding the center of cylindrical parts. So we're going to be producing a D-shaped hole, but I would also like to sink a profile. So let's produce a profile sinking electrode. In this case, it's just going to be a series of concentric rings. And here's the beast, a die sinking EDM, a very accurate machine. Now, this die sinking EDM has an X axis and it has a Y axis. It also has a Z axis, but in this case, I prefer to call it a ram because all it does is raise and lower the electrode. When machining, the part is submerged in dielectric fluid. So what I've done here is installed my part in a precision vise on one, two, three blocks. And the only reason I did that was to raise the vise up a little bit because with the doors closed, it's gonna be hard to see. Now, there's not a lot of room to work here, so this may seem a little odd, but I'm using a small piece of brass and a small ball-peen hammer to align the vise.
before we start using the electrodes that we've produced, I'm going to start here by using an old gear-shaped electrode that I used some years ago for a punch and die project. And I'm going to use it just to demonstrate the difference between roughing and finishing cuts. In this case here, I'm using a finishing cut with smaller sparks to remove very small parts or particles of material at a time. So let's take a closer look at the finish that we obtain with these light or small sparks. using the same part and the same electrode, but after cranking up the power level and increasing the gap to give us some room to clear those large particles, we're going to take another cut. We're going to see this one is going to be a lot more violent. Cutting with an EDM really is a slow process. So if we can use roughing cuts, it really helps to speed things up. However, it will leave a lot rougher finish. It's important to note that if you're going to rough out a pocket or a hole, you're going to have to use a smaller electrode to start with because it's going to be cutting more oversized with longer sparks and then use a larger electrode for finishing. We can see here that the cut is a lot more efficient, but the finish is a lot rougher. Our D-shaped electrode has been mounted in the machine's head, which is now going to be adjusted to the ram using an electromagnet. The electromagnet holds the head, but a few clamps are used just in case there is a power outage. There, everything is held in tightly. Now we can adjust the electrode's position to be just over where we want it to produce the hole. Then we'll lower the ram so that the electrode just barely clears the top of the part. Then we will adjust the depth stop alarm and the depth of cut. It's, this is very important because this machine will just keep cutting even if the head meets the part it'll keep going. So we want to adjust the depth. Uh, once that's adjusted and it hits that depth the alarm will sound and the machine will turn off. You have to remember that these are very slow cutting machines, so the operator quite often will go work on a different machine while the cut is being made. Making the depth adjustment, the alarm, and the depth cutoff very important features of this machine. For this demonstration, I'm not overly concerned with surface finish, so I'm going to be using a lot of power, in other words, a roughing cut here. Because it's slow, I don't want to spend the rest of the day cutting. This cut is going to take about an hour and a quarter to perform. You can see that these are quite large sparks and they're producing a lot of small particles that you see floating away as gray smoke in the dielectric fluid. I'd better get the flush going here or I'm going to start to have an arcing problem. There, there the flush is going and you can hear that the cut is a lot more efficient.
So let's take a closer look at the process here. Here we can see that the machine is cutting with a 1000 flutter. Work time up, ram up, ram down, cutting with a 1000 flutter. Here we see cutting with a 1000 flutter and the arc height is set quite high because we're deep in the part, back up, down, cutting again with our 1000 flutter. Now if we watch the amps and watts, we can see that we're cutting, we've got a lot of work going on, power is going to turn off, ram up, power on, ram down, cutting again with our 1000 flutter. You may have noticed that as the tool cuts, it retracts after a certain amount of time. That's called the working time, and that's something you adjust and also something you need to adjust is the anti-arc height. That's the distance that the tool retracts once a work cycle is complete or if something is wrong with the cut. Let's say there's arcing because there's just too many particles between the electrode and the part being cut. It's important because the deeper you get into the part, the more it has to retract to be able to flush the particles that are stuck inside the cavity. It's a bit like a pump. When the tool retracts, it sucks dielectric fluid into the cavity. And then when it plunges back in, it pushes that oil out, cleaning everything at the same time. There, the hole is complete. But remember, it has been a long process. It's been sped up by jumping over several, several cycles of electrode in, electrode out. Hey, it's the magic of video. And there's an accurate D-shaped hole in a piece of hardened tool steel. Now that we have that hole, we're going to use it to flush upwards through the part for our large profiling electrode. Now large profiling electrodes have large surfaces and they're notoriously bad for arcing. So we really have to get all the flushing that we can up in between that electrode and the part that it's cutting. Now we're starting our cut for the profiling operation and again this cut was sped up and the whole cut took about 10 minutes to perform. So, well, there's a lot of to and fro that have been taken out, but it's just more of the same. You may also note here that the anti-arc retract distance has been reduced greatly. That's because this electrode will never penetrate the surface deeply. And while reducing that retract height really speeds things up. And there you go, the two cuts are complete, a D-shaped hole cut and a profile cut of concentric circles around that D-shaped hole. Now, this is in a piece of hardened tool steel, and that is something that's difficult to do by traditional machining methods. I would like to thank Patrick Mayville, Chair of Skilled Trades Institute at La Cité College in Ottawa. Thank him for granting me access to the shop in order to produce this video. It's very refreshing to know that there are young people out there who still believe that teaching trades is something that is of the utmost importance. So, thank you, Patrick. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I know I had a great time producing it. If you did enjoy it, please take a few seconds to like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget, I have a free online machine shop course that you can find on the first page of my website, thatlazymachinist.com. So if that could interest you for novice machinists, well, go check that out. Until we meet again, have fun, be 
Save. It's so important. And happy machining.